Have we seen the bottom of the bear market? Is value going to continue to outperform growth? And what about the midterms? Listen in as I speak with Jeff DeMasso on another Advisor You Can Talk To podcast. Hello, this is Dan Wiener, and this is another Advisor You Can Talk To podcast. I'm here with Jeff DeMasso. He's the Interim Chief Investment Officer at Advisor, and of course, I'm our chairman and founder. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about the markets. And Jeff, uh, nice day to talk about the markets after an incredible October, huh? Uh, it is. I mean, October is coming off of a pretty incredible September as well, right? So so September was down 9.3% in the S&P. It's third worst September since 1957. And October bounced back big. As, as you said, it was a blowout month. It was the Dow's 11th best month since 1889. It's pretty remarkable. And I think maybe maybe that's where we can jump off of. If we'd been talking a month ago, we would have said, hey, we're clearly in a bear market. Yep. And now I guess the question is, you know, are we are we still in a bear market? Are we not? Uh, how does what we've been through compare to history? Give us a little context here, Dan. Yeah, well, you know, I, I like to go to the charts sometimes and, and just look at how long bear markets have endured, how quickly they fall, those sort of things. And boy, when I chart the current bear market against some of the big ones that we've had over the over the last few decades, you know, we've had we've basically had three big bear markets over the last two decades. The bursting of the tech bubble in the aughts, the great financial crisis, you know, 2008, 2009, uh, beginning in 2007, and then of course the the very quick but, you know, the clawing we took in the COVID bear, right? And mm-hmm. You know, the the pattern remains the same. Some of these some of these markets drop faster. Some of them drop bigger. Right now, this is looking pretty average to me. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I agree. If we if we put some numbers on it, you know, the the average bear market since 1970 is at a had a decline of about 37 percent, and it's taken uh, 13 months for them to hit bottom. Uh, this one. And this is assuming that October twelfth was the low, and you know, no, no guarantees on that at all. I'm not trying to make a forecast on it, but if that's the case, then we're talking about a decline of twenty five percent, and it took about nine months to get there. So maybe a little bit below average in terms of magnitude and length, but but you know, in and around the averages, particularly given we're not talking about a big data set here. Uh, but for me, the really big point when it comes to bear markets is that they all end. Right? Every, every bear market comes to an end and, and has been followed by bull markets and expansions. And if you right. look at those past end of the bear market and look out over the next one, three, and five year returns, you're talking about some pretty attractive returns from those points. Um, you know, The five year return on average from the end of a bear market is more than doubling your money, up around 120%. Uh, so again, point being, bear markets end, they're painful when you're in them. Uh, but as long-term investors, you want to make sure you stay the course and hold on for those bull markets. You know, the other the other thing that's sort of characteristic, at least of the last couple of big bear markets, and I'm I'm going to take the COVID bear out because it 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 happened so fast and it was over so quickly. But you know, back in uh, the aughts when the tech bubble burst, and in the current market, when you could say to a certain extent the the fang bubble burst, the the tech bubble burst, you saw this huge disparity in returns between what are typically called growth stocks and what are typically called value stocks, and the extreme between uh, you know you can look at it a lot of different ways, but let's just look at twelve month returns. The extreme between the twelve month returns on tech stock uh, growth stocks. And the twelve-month returns on value stocks, it, it was it was enormous back in you know the February time period in two thousand one, two thousand, and then uh, sorry in two thousand. Then you know a year later, it was extreme in the other to the other end. And the same thing seems to have happened here. We hit an extreme around the fall of of twenty twenty, and now we've hit another. I think a fairly big extreme here during 2022, you know, for small stocks, it really was earlier this year for large stocks, the growth versus value differential, you know, has really hit the extreme right about now. 
And boy, when these things bounce back, as you noted, uh, it can be incredibly fast and incredibly strong. But these have both been in big outlier bear market uh, extremes, you know, running from growth to value. And, um, you know, we've seen that with the oils running hot now. And of course, the, the, the big cap growth stocks uh, being taken out uh, to the woodshed. How long does this last, do you think? Ooh, I mean, the, the how long does it last question, I think is really impossible to, to answer. I guess what I would note on the, you know, growth versus value and you, know, you talked about the tech bubble and a bit of a parallel to the experience we're going through now with tech selling off and quote unquote value stocks doing well. But in the global financial crisis, it was value stocks, the energies, the financial stocks uh, that, that did poorly. So I don't think it's enough to just simply say there's a bear market coming, value is going to outperform growth. Everyone's a little bit different. And, and frankly, I think the value versus growth conversation can really distract investors from from you know, the, the practice of trying to be a, a good long-term investor. I mean, what is a value investor? What, what is a growth investor? All the managers I've spoken to, and I've talked to a lot of them, want to buy stocks today at one price and sell them in the future for a higher price, right? They right. want to buy it at a low value today, sell at a higher value, you know, tomorrow or Except in the back in the day when we used to talk to the people at Turner Investments, which doesn't exist anymore because they were willing to pay sp- a lot of money for stocks on the expectation they'd be able to sell them for even more money. And of course, they blew up and they disappeared. But that's history. Even then, they expected stock prices to go up. And that was, that was kind of the game. But but as you said, with these swings, it's like look, certain types of stocks go in and out of favor. Right? The market is driven by sentiment. Sometimes it's like, hey, tech is going to change the world and we all got to pile in the tech. And then other times it's, ah, no, it's not changing the world and you know, energy is where we got to be, oil is where we got to be, because there's a, a war and supply chains are all screwed up. I feel like it's deja vu time around these oil stocks again, right? We've heard this before. I mean, it's, it is really deja vu that the big oils are, are you know, minting profits and, they're, and you know, they're, they're taking advantage of everyone. Boy, it wasn't that way a couple of years ago. Well, this comes back to your question about about you know, how long does this go on? Is that we know markets are cyclical and stocks come in and out of favor and trying to time those cycles are extremely difficult. You're, maybe, maybe someone can try and get the broad trends, but you are not going to get turning points for sure. Uh, so I think the way to combat that is just have balance in your portfolio. You know, have a diversified portfolio that gives you exposure to these different areas. So you're going to participate wherever the cycle takes us next. Let's maybe pivot. We're talking a bit about inflation here. And, and that October rally was interesting to me because coming into September, everyone was worried about the Fed. And you know, we're recording on Tuesday morning, November 1st, and the Fed is kicking off their next meeting right now where they seem you know, likely to, to hike the Fed funds rate. And we're talking about transient inflation, pivot. Let's pivot to politics. The midterms are coming. Typically, the third year in a presidential cycle is supposed to be the best one. And if we get a divided Congress, that's also supposed to be, in theory, good for stocks. Where do we go from here? This is a topic that we will come back to in more detail with our financial planning team, because the elections and politics usually have more impact in terms of financial planning, taxes, estates, and how we think about that. As you said, on the investment side, we try to keep politics out of our portfolios. I always feel like that there's always half of our client base that uh, you know, has an opportunity, opportunity to make a mistake by being upset about who is in the White House or who is in control of Congress and avoiding being in the market. Um, and then usually four years later, eight years later, the other half of our client base gets that same wonderful opportunity. That said, if we step back and just say, okay, what does the data tell us in looking at the market? And as you said, that third year in the presidential cycle or third year of a presidential term tends to be pretty good. And and the data does back that up. You know, uh, we went and looked at uh, how did the market do in the 12 months leading up to a midterm election? And on average, stocks gained about 4% in that 12-month period. But if you look at the 12 months following a midterm election, the market gained 16% on average. Now, that's not a ton of data points. That's going back to the, the 1950s or so. Um, so I would 
wouldn't recommend that anyone go all in and change their investment strategy just based on that data set or based on politics either. I mean, the economy is a very, very complex machine. I mean, the cup of tea I have in front of me, the amount that of effort and different pieces that went into getting that cup of tea to me are pretty mind blowing. And then Wait a minute, are you not, reading the tea leaves, Jeff? Is that, I am, is that what you're telling me? They're, they're in the tea bag, so I'm having difficulty seeing them right now. But uh, what, just, uh, what, what did it take to get that tea bag to you? It's it's an insanely complex chain, and that's just for a little bit of uh, you know tea leaves. Um, and then the stock market's not the economy, and the political system influences those, but is also a little bit outside. So trying to to invest based off of one input, whether it's a midterm election the next Fed meeting, the next inflation report. Uh, I just think that you're going to be chasing your tail and your portfolio is not going to be better off for it. So bottom line, keep diversified, stick with your plan. These are timeless principles for a reason, Dan, and why we come back to them over and over again. We do come back to them. It's real important. We think they're important for clients to hear again, particularly in times like this where people are worried about the election, the Fed, the bear market, the war in Europe. There's a lot of reasons to be worried right now and concerned and consumer sentiment reflects that. Yes, again, bear markets happen and they're painful and we feel that right alongside our clients investing alongside them. But we also know that bear markets end once again. They do end and bull markets and expansions have outrun those bear markets in the long run. Right. And and you know, you have to be an investor. You can't be a trader. Traders get involved in a lot of portfolio activity, but it's it's unclear that they make any money as a result. Meanwhile, we know that as an investor, you will make money over time. Yeah. Fidelity did a study looking at their, the performance of accounts held at Fidelity and broke them into different groups based on how much they traded. And the best portfolios, the best performing group of portfolios were those that hadn't been traded because the owner had passed away and there'd just been no activity. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, some portfolio activity makes sense. Um, you know, particularly if it's around rebalancing, managing taxes. There's there's some nice upkeep that you can do to your portfolio, but generally speaking, uh, you know, an overactive trading, um, if, particularly if it's not part of a disciplined strategy and process, tends to do more harm than. Good. And particularly if you've done the financial planning that we do at Advisor, and you've gotten together with your team, and you said, "Here's the." allocation. Here's the distribution of assets we think is important. Um, you know, this will get you to your objectives, to your goals down the road. You don't want to be making trades that upset that well-crafted balance, primarily between stocks and bonds. Absolutely. And if you're concerned, bring it back to your advisor and to your planner and run through the plan again and see if you're still on track, given where the market has moved. And you might be pleasantly surprised that see you are still on track because a lot of plans take into account that bear markets happen. But if not, then at least you have the knowledge and opportunity to make shifts to try and improve the situation. All right, Jeff, thanks. Let's leave it there. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Advisor You Can Talk To podcast. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe and review our show. You can check us out at advisorinvestments.com slash podcasts. Your feedback is always welcome. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to explore, please email us at an info at advisorinvestments.com. And that's advisor with an E. Before closing, I'd like to thank Kaylee Steele, Tim Weidenheimer, and Ashlyn Melvin, they do all the hard work making this podcast possible. Jeff DeMasso and I just sit here and talk into the microphone. Thank you all for listening.